Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Under the Forelock. I'm Betsy Bullhorn, and today I have Heidi Potter joining us. She is the owner of Holistic Horsemanship and an internationally known trainer, clinician, and instructor with over 50 years experience in uh, horses and also, fun fact, uh, martial arts. So she has been uh, strongly practicing uh, traditional uh, Eastern martial arts uh, for about the same amount of time, and we're going to talk a little bit more about how she's integrated that practice. That's why I'm making a big deal about it. Uh, she's also, we got a bunch of certifications I'm gonna roll through here. Uh, she's a centered variety clinician, holistic horsemanship trainer, certified horsemanship association, master instructor and clinic instructor and a senior horse speak instructor. Uh, another fun fact about Heidi, she studied directly with Sally Swift, centered riding, uh, who was a neighbor and became a friend and mentor uh, for Heidi as well. And lastly, uh, Heidi is the author of Open Heart, Open Mind, A Pathway to Rediscovering Horsemanship, um, which is really talking about her integration of traditional martial arts and Eastern philosophies uh, with horsemanship um, to create what she's called the five elements of successful horsemanship. Uh, the book also has uh, exercises and case studies and all kinds of good stuff there. Uh, most important part though is it is for all horses, all breeds, all levels, temperaments, and ages. So Heidi, welcome to the show. <laughs> uh, pretty long pedigree there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot of ground to cover. Yeah. Uh, and there were a few things I didn't mention, uh, but um, let's, uh, let's start with the five elements of successful horsemanship, because I mean, I feel like uh, the martial arts has been, you know, a long part of your life along with horses and you've kind of, you know, put this amalgamation together to create this, this five elements. So can you talk through for the audience who's not familiar with that, what, what those are? Yeah, sure. So um, I trained in two different styles of very traditional martial arts. One was uh, Shorin Ru and one was Shaolin Kempo. And I would find myself in the dojo um, as the lessons were being taught, and a lot of lessons, you know, it's always about mindfulness and awareness and being in the moment. And it was, it was really um, mind, body, and spirit training. So it was, a, it was really a combination. But I would find myself hearing the lessons, and immediately I translated it into horses. Like I could not go there in my brain. So no matter what it was, if they were talking about clear intent, or they were talking about energy, or they were talking about balance or breathing, um, whatever it was, I immediately would translate it in my mind to horsemanship. So that, that for me was just something I, it couldn't be prevented. <laughs> it, it was just kind of like an epiphany. And did yeah. you find, you know, with the martial arts practice, um, did, when you were going to the barn, were you kind of uh, unconsciously or consciously applying some of those concepts, right? So if, you know, I, I always use the nervous one because that's what everybody relates to, but, you know, you're nervous and it's like, oh, okay, well, I know how to get centered in my martial arts practice or in my Eastern philosophy practice. Let me try that here. Like, was that kind of something you were doing or how did that, like in a practical application, how did that yeah. work? Yeah. Um Definitely in my teaching, I mean, in terms of myself, what, what principles I kind of brought into my own work was really the mindfulness mm -hmm. and being in the moment, trying to be really present, um, being really open and understanding the energy component of what energy I bring, the horse is definitely perceiving that. Mm. Um, but for my students, and as you know, in, in, in horses, the largest demographic is adult women over 50, you know, at least in most of my circles yes. um, for a lot of years, a lot, yeah. and maybe over 40, but for a lot, a lot, a lot of years, you go to a clinic and that's 80% of the, of the participants. And I would say a very large percentage of them did deal with the nervousness that you mentioned, um, whether they wrote as a child and then, you know, we're fearless when we're kids. We, mm -hmm. we don't know what we don't know. and We haven't had all the experiences yet. So right. then we become older and wiser. So whether they were women that came back to riding or they were the ones that always wanted a pony and never had one until they had their families and they had their careers and maybe they retired or at least they got to a point financially and, and with their time that they could actually now embrace this dream. Um, so with that comes a lot of, a lot of anxiety and nervousness, which is smart, <laughs> we're, you know, <laughs> yes. we're yes. getting on mm -hmm. thousand pound fighter fight flight animals, you know, it's, it's exactly, yeah, it's quite yeah. crazy. So um, I work a lot with 
insecurities and these principles are invaluable. Um, and they share, you know, a lot of the principles I talk about come from the basics of centered riding, which have a component of, of the martial arts in there, the Tai Chi, um, which Sally Swift, the founder, practiced. So uh, centered riding is based very much, and we maybe we'll get into that later, um, on different modalities she worked with through her life. But there's that martial art component. So that's why it, it really um, resonated with me when I started learning centered riding. I was like, oh, now all these principles go together beautifully in riding. And then I yeah. took it to horsemanship just in general. So a lot. So, so a, whole, a whole nother letter. So one thing I want to go back to the, the women of a certain age, right? Yeah. Because I, you know, it's, it's interesting that you say that and we'll, maybe we'll go off on a little tangent, but I think, um, yeah, I, I, you know, I'm wondering too, if there's a demographic, right? So, you know, we get in our forties and our fifties as women, and you have a lot of life experience or saying, you know what, mm, I may be doing things for the last 20, 30 years and that's not really working for me and I'm going to try a different way. And I, and I think we kind of come into this like, I don't know, awareness, maturation level that you, you want something a little bit different versus, you know, say teenager or, you know, a younger, younger writer. And I'm not just going to say women, but, you know, a younger writer. Yeah. So of the percentage, uh, so do you think that part of the attraction maybe uh, for some of this is right there's a I, I think a certain amount of um what am i trying to say uh kind of tempering or you come you come with a certain amount of life experience where you're really ready for that and you want something different that's yes. a little more grounded versus say a younger a younger person yeah yes i definitely yeah. agree you know at least for me when you're younger it's adrenaline you know yeah. it's like the faster, yeah. the better. Like, you know, we would all be crazy and line up on the end of this road and see who could, you know, we would <laughs> race. We would race. It was a horse, a farm that I, I worked on. I talk about it at the beginning of my book. Um, uh, friends of mine, their family owned it and I helped them. We took out trail rides and that's how we did spent our summers, but we were crazy. And so there was a road called Stone Road and we'd all take our horses and line up and on your market set go as fast as we could. I luckily had a 16 hand appendix quarter horse. So we were fast. Wow. So of course it was great for me because I was yeah. in the lead. There was one little bay looking back. Oh geez, I don't know what he was. Maybe he had some Arab in him. Um, he, he was a little quicker on the sprint, but we had him in the long run. So, and, the, and all the kids behind were getting pelleted with stones. So you really needed to be in the front because there it was a stone. It was called we called it the stone road. It was all this little gravel, right? It was just crazy. Um, it was craziness, but yeah, adrenaline. Like the more exciting, the better. Um, and I think what you say about you know they they say you know the lesson arrives when the student is ready, right? So right. coming into a more mature period in our lives, we are e more easily able to slow it down. And I think take great comfort in looking at the whole package. So it's not for most people about the <laughs> adrenaline rush. It's more about, I want to enjoy this. And what yeah. does it take for me to relax and be on the right type of horse so I can feel safe. And these principles that, you know, that we'll talk about, the elements are something in all of my clinics and workshops. I I work with them on the ground and we experience it with each other. And then I give them examples of when in life they can practice it. So I say, don't try to do all this for the one hour out of 24 hours that you're practice it the other 23 hours that you're not with your horse. So it becomes ingrained in you. And kind of reflexive, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So just, just curious to continue with the tangent a little bit. So the 20% that do come that are not, right, the demographic that we talked about. I'm just curious, is that a younger, uh, a younger crowd? Or I mean, so if, if, you know, that difference, like what, what is attracting them to the work, right? Is yeah. It... So I would say some is a younger crowd. Um, and it may be, or they could be more mature, let's say, um, <laughs> yeah. and be accomplished riders, um, mm -hmm. maybe they're competitors. Mm -hmm. And pretty much, I think what draws people to centered riding and to my holistic horsemanship approach is really um, compassion for the horse and the need to be comfortable. You know, they want to be confident. We've kind of talked about that a little bit, but they have a desire to be comfortable in their own body, to make sure what they're doing doesn't interfere 
with the natural balance of the horse, right? To make sure mm -hmm. that whatever we do as riders is making the horse's job as easy as possible. So I think just that desire of becoming a better rider. I mean, I think all of us that ride strive to become better riders. You know, when I ride, I had a beautiful trail ride yesterday. The weather finally broke and I went out early in the morning um, and uh, trail it to a favorite place we ride. I'm working on me the whole time I'm riding. And, and, and I am working with my horse too, but it has to go through me first. So that's the thing with centered riding. Sally Swift taught in the very first clinic that I was in the 75-25 rule, which is you put 75% of your energy on you and you only give your horse 25%. So what that can mean in the saddle is you're feeling like your horse is on the forehand. Fix yourself, fix yourself, do a half halt. How are you, how's your balance? You know, can you open your chest? Can you lighten your seat? And can you get on your haunches a little bit? And mm -hmm. then can you lift with your legs and lighten your seat a little bit and encourage the horse to come up underneath you to make his job easier? Right. You know? So right. there's all these tools we have to help us make his job easier. So it's never, my horse drops his sh inside shoulder on the turn. How do I, how do I stop? How do I correct him from doing that? Right. It's or always, either pick it up, right? Like you got to do. Yeah. 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 So we're saying, okay, so what do we have to do? We have to lift our rib cage. We have to check in with our seat bones. Are they balanced? Maybe shift a little to the outside seat bone, right? We have to make sure our, our inside rib cage is open. Our inside shoulder is opening in the turn, but we're balanced on that outside seat bone to stay upright. Mm -hmm. You know, so there's, it's just filled with what can we do in our bodies to support the horse. And I think that really draws people. It draws people into these clinics because the results speak for themselves. And, you know, what I hear from, <laughs> it's kind of interesting, what I hear from, um, from students is that they've, they've in the past, <clears throat> so at least at some point in their life, they've worked with instructors that really like put a lot of pressure on them or made them cry. I can't tell you how many people say, you know, oh, my, I cried all the time. You're yes. raising your hand. Yes, I, 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 had, I actually had an instructor that because I did not sit up straight enough, she fought, this is a true story. She followed me around with a carriage whip and would whip me in the back. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I hear stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you exactly. paid her. <laughs> I did. I you did. I kept her going back that. because I didn't know any better. And then, you know, right. here I come back to writing the same thing. Now I have money and time and I have to unlearn. And my, my instructor will tell you, I mean, when I sat, I was like this, you know, I mean, you know, the girls were straight up because oh. I was afraid. <laughs> you know, right. <laughs> oh, so, yeah. I hear you. So that's, that's what I'm talking about. So something that drives people, like I said, whether they've had a lifetime of riding and they're accomplished or they're new to riding and they heard about it. Um, something, you know, I think that, that draws them into centered riding is the idea that we can fix the horse by fixing ourselves, so to speak, and we're gonna go at it in a way that's really empathetic and compassionate for the horse and the human. Mm -hmm. so, so like you said, I mean, people come in with all these stories and I'm like, you're paying someone to abuse you kind of. <laughs> oh yeah, never mind the screaming bit, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Oh my so, gosh. So, yeah. Yeah, go so that's, that's not our thing at all. So I think that also drives people to this work. For sure. Yeah, because you know, the, the, the thing is I'm hearing you talking and I and I think it's a little bit of a shame. So I'm gonna put a plug in here if you're a younger writer, <laughs> is uh, one of the things that I found um, you know, and and applying some of these different techniques, you know, that I've been talking to a lot of different guests, right? And I'm going on my own journey and starting to compete. Uh, but it so you know, some of these things, it just makes it so much easier and it actually gives you a little bit of an edge. And the other part is that I, I you you can see the correlation between that right and in your own energy and your own body and centering and, and and all those different things and then intuitively right you know because i do classical dressage um is what i really geek out on but you could see where intuitively i think the old masters knew this they just didn't know how to talk about it like they had a different way of talking about it but then it for me it was like oh it was like almost the last piece of the puzzle clicked in and it was like okay now i understand why i position my body this way or this or touches this or that does that from a, this more of a kind of an energetic way right 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so that's my plug for you, younger writers. You, you may want to think about it. Yeah. <laughs> so, and and I'll, you know. I'll also say, you know, and I think it's great to ride a lot of different horses. I think yes. it's great to ride with a lot of different teachers because you're yeah. always getting something. Um, centered riding's focus is on not telling you what to do, but telling you how to do something. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. for example, um, get your heels down. You know, get your heels down, get your heels down, get your, well, if you're a student and in, in, in CHA, you know, we, we certify riding instructors. And so mm -hmm. one of the things I always say to these instructors coming up through the ranks is, if your student could do what you were asking them to do, they would do it. Like, right. so we have to understand they they're not paying you and coming to be educated to not do what you're asking them to do. It's more that they, they can't do it or they think they are and they're not, right? We yeah. all need a ground person. Yes. So... In centered riding, what I may say is relax your ankles and lengthen your calves. Mm, mm -hmm. I won't say get your heels down because we actually right. don't want heels. Heels down tends yeah. to encourage people to push. Yeah. And once yeah. you've braced in your stirrups, then you've locked out all your joints, your ankle, your knee, your hip, your lower back. Everything's locked as soon as you apply tension. So especially if the lower leg's in front of you at all. So if you're pushing at all oh, the, the water ski yeah everything's yeah. happening in your body that you don't want to have happen you're and you're actually lifting yourself out of the saddle where you actually kind of want to be connected yeah. um you're not in balance your shoulder hip and heel because you lost the the lower leg and then when you add tension and brace and push yeah everything goes wrong from there and, yeah. it, and it doesn't feel good to the horse either so yeah. anytime you feel like something's forced you want to find a different way. And I, and I think that's where Sally Swift, one of the places she really excelled is with all the imagery she mm. provided us with, you know, and that, that came from, from her own life, from growing up with severe scoliosis and working with Mabel Todd, who was a body worker. She was the author of The Thinking Body. And she, uh, she used imagery and kind of thinking about from the inside, working out, how can you find balance in your body? And so centered yeah. writing is filled with imagery. And you know, it's interesting because you mentioned she had that Tai Chi background. And um, you know, one of the things, I mean, I did different martial arts from, from what you did and from what Sally did, but I would say that, uh, you know, kind of thematic is that you're very aware of what's happening in individual parts of your body, right? So you know, when I was learning a certain kind of a kick and a strike, it was very slow motion and you very focused on every single aspect of that. So there's this real kind of, uh, you know, uh, super hyper awareness of every little like inside. Uh, and so it's interesting that when you talked about the heels down, I don't know how to do it. Well, heels down. Okay. That's the, that's the end result, but you know, the relaxing of the ankle and letting the calf kind of drop that's something where I'm very hyper aware of those two things that I can do, right? So it's interesting that switch um, where we're talking about the body and being very like in that slow motion and very kind of individualized, which I, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, feels like to me is that very uh, martial art type of influence there. Yeah, and, and body awareness, we're always going to try as instructors to put it into a positive mm -hmm. place, right? And, and, and from a place of relaxation. Yes. Yeah. So our key, you know, our, our, our goal is always reducing stress and tension. That's, you have to start there, right? Yeah. In horse speak, it's referred to as going to zero. So yes. when we're riding, yeah. we, need to be, we need to be active, so to speak, right? We have to carry our own bodies. We're not sitting like a sack of potatoes. We're not sitting on our pockets. Because yes. then our hip is locked out and we can't move with the horse, right? Our pelvis has to be in that neutral position so we can stay light and we can follow the, the movement of the horse's back, right? He's, we're riding on all those muscles. And so, but we're going to go at it in a way of letting go of tensions and building in body awareness. Mm -hmm. So example, say the lower leg does go forward because somebody has gotten really used to bracing in their stirrups. The quick fix for that is point your knees down. So Sally Swift called it stubby legs. Okay, so if you had no leg below the knee and you're riding on your horse, your thighs would point pretty straight down. Okay, yeah. so you can't do both. And, and this is especially true when people are coming into a halt. When they're settling into a halt, sometimes 
the lower the feet get pushed forward and if it comes from driving and putting on the brake or where that comes from but, <laughs> yeah you know and then yeah. you braced everything you drove your seat bones in you pushed you tensed you did all this so a very quick way to not do that is to say we always use breath right our mm -hmm. first step of the five elements so i would say take a deep breath in when you exhale drop your knees down follow the motion of the horse drop your knees down left right left right stop so if you do that when you're exhaling, you're relaxing into a halt. And then from there, you can take it into the square halt. I compete in Western dressage. So you're right, square halts, all the good components are in there. It's all wonderful. So we have all these nice little juicy things to, to give people to help. Not say don't do it, but here, try this. And it, and it works. So, well, and, and I think the visualization, it, it, it's very personalized, right? So there's no wrong answer where I think you know, the heels down is a really good, a good one. I mean, cause I, you know, you and I are roughly around the same age and that was like <laughs> heels down, right? That was a big deal. And, uh, but it goes back to like not knowing the how, and then you, and you have a picture, right? Cause your instructor's heels were like cranked down, you know, I mean, especially in the hunters and, uh, right. you know, you'd see pictures of this is proper, right? And, uh, so, so then now you're comparing yourself against an ideal that your body can't even, you may not ever be able to imitate that for whatever reason, because of injury or your own physical confirmation or whatever. So the visualization is nice because you're going to find the relaxation that feels right for your body. And then that just follows, right? Which yes. Is, which is lovely. Yeah. 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 And, you know, a really important piece of this, it's true with centered riding, but really in all the clinics I teach, we start off the horse. Even mm -hmm. if it's an in hand, I'm an, I'm an accredited horse agility trainer with the club in England. So yeah. we start, I always start with a workshop and in centered riding, the morning is all the whole morning, not just like a lot of times it'll be like an hour workshop and I'll have a few things we'll do together without horses. In centered riding, it's really the whole morning typically is without horses. It's for self-reflection and self, um, awareness and we work with human horse partners mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so you're my horse i'm the rider and yeah. we do all kinds of things but in terms of even you know getting your feet underneath you okay yeah. that balance that your shoulder hip and heel we practice it on the ground so along with the imagery that we provide you in the saddle you actually get to go through some body awareness off the horse because that's where you want to be aware become aware of it and get some strategies so we can fix it on the ground or at least address it. Um, it's really tough to, to wait till you're in the saddle and then try to fix it all, right? Well, and especially when you have all the other stuff going on, right? You know, and it kind of goes back to, I'm going to use the word feel, but within your own body, like, so if I'm doing it on the ground and I know what it feels like to be centered and balanced, I know that feel. And, and so when I'm in the saddle and now I'm dealing with variables of being nervous or the horse is this and that, and there's somebody like cutting me off here and blah, 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 blah. Reins, oh my God but I can at least try for that feel, right? So that's, that's the great thing about the practice for sure. Yeah. So I, you know, it's funny cause I, I, um, I had a, a experience, um, I mean, this was a, you know, a, a classical trainer, but we were doing pillar work and he did the same thing. And he said, okay, two of you are going to be the horse. One's going to be the front, one's going to be the back. And then the other person, you know, so we held, you know, you hold the lunge rope and the, you know, the, like, just like you would where the horse was, we were holding the rope. But the thing that was very interesting to me, because we switched, but I was the behind at one point. And, um, <laughs> but as he was, and just at the walk, like asking us to do a figure eight through, through the pillars, you know, and he was very gentle, but the, I felt like emotionally that pressure, like it was, it was really interesting. Just, just even with the late, you know, I, what was coming up inside of me. Right. And it made me have a huge appreciation for what, the horse was going through and I was a person I could talk to him and be like you know are yeah. you gonna tap me with that like what are you yes. doing you know yeah but to have that experience like as a human horse like it was it, it definitely it really shifted my mindset pretty quickly yeah that's that. yeah yeah absolutely I did um I've done like lunging workshops mm -hmm. and and one of the things we start out with is I had them lunge each other because you have to feel like, what, it, what does it feel like to be in the middle? What does it feel like to have, like you said, have somebody there with a whip? You could be that person in the middle being the horse and the only thing, and this happened to me when I experienced it, 
the only thing I cared about was that whip. What are you going to do with that whip? Yeah. I was totally aware of the whip. Yeah. Um, so it just brings this whole awareness, not only to position, right? If the person lunging, if their center gets a little in front of the drive line, you're going to stop or turn around. Mm -hmm. And then some people unknowingly will correct the horse, get after them. They're not to stop. They're not to turn around. But in effect, and, and also with liberty work, right? Yes. Yeah. So it's super important. We've done a lot of liberty work and you get just a little bit in front, the horse stops or turns around and then the horse gets reprimanded for it if the human doesn't understand the line of energy. Um, and if you have a big old whipper flag or something, it's easy to be not mindful of your body position and energy because then you just back it up with the whatever you have in your hand. Yeah, and twirling um, it around. Yeah. yeah, so really to give the horse's perspective, um, I do that in every clinic. It doesn't matter if it's horse speak, if it's horse agility, horsemanship, if it's stress-free obstacle training, if it's centered riding, whatever it is, I make sure to give them some experiences to reflect on. And it's just their aha moments happen regularly. I'm sure, I'm they, sure you watch these huge revelations because I, exactly the same thing. And even just without, and I knew, this is a weird thing is, I knew Craig was never gonna hit me with that whip. Right. You know, again, we could talk and communicate to each other, right? The horrors, you know, and, and I, it's, it's really amazing how much emotion, you know, that you, you come up with. So, I mean, I'm wondering, like, did the students like, kind of like, oh, did you have a lot of students who just like their minds just exploded? Oh, like it was absolutely. total epiphany. Yeah. I can't tell you how many people just go, oh, my poor horse. And they're just mortified. You know, yeah. I'll give you. I'll give you a quick example. Um, I was out in Colorado many, many, many years ago doing a centered riding clinic, a lot of Western riders, had a very nice uh, husband and wife, probably in their 50s or 60s, um, raised and trained their own quarter horses to go and trail ride with them. And he actually made the, um, the, the bridal setup that they had, this gentleman actually made them and they had the Western leather slobber straps and oh, the Makate wow. reins. So the rope rein on one side and the Makate and rope rein on the other, right? So oh, yeah. Yep. Two on one side knotted on the leather slobber strap and one on the other side, right? So in all of the centered riding clinics, we do an exercise, which was one of the most revealing exercises in the whole weekend is you hold the bit, I hold the reins. We move back and forth with our arms and hands and we practice following the motion. We practice halts, half halts, turns, sensitivity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And after doing this, not only was one big realization with that setup of the Makati rain, there is a tremendous amount of weight on one side of the bit. Oh, just hanging off. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there is on both sides of the bit. I use those for yeah. a short time. And after I experienced this, I never used them again um, because I was working with a trainer who used them. So I used it. Cool idea. You have an extra rope to tie your horse. I would never tie by the bit anyways, but it was just, it was part of the equipment. People mm -hmm. get into just, it's part of the equipment. It's there. I don't know why it's there. We just use it. <laughs> um, but after experiencing that, I was like, oh my gosh, this is this is horrible because now we've got not only kind of heavy rope reins with knots and those slobber straps are, are moving around, but these guys are riding up in the Rockies. Okay. So the, it's very mountainous. Obviously the weight of those ropes are swinging as the horse is and walking. It's doing this, yeah. right. With so the, yeah. With a bit. Not only yeah. is it swinging on their mouth, which is so sensitive, but then you've got double weight on one side. This poor man, after that exercise, he goes, oh my gosh, he goes, I think I'll just put him in the pasture and look at them. <laughs> oh no. Oh. He was, he, and he was yeah. such a sweet man. And he was just like, oh my gosh, I never knew. I think I'll just put him in the pasture and, and, and I won't ride them anymore. I'll just look at them. <laughs> but literally, I, yeah, this yeah. stuff happens all the time. Um, so it's, I just love it. I love the, the whole journey of sharing experiences with people and helping them open up to the compassion that's already within them, but to ex extend the empathy to the horse. And the only way to do that is to put yourself in the horse's place. Oh, and they have those experiences. Yeah, because it is, it's, you know, and you do and you feel, I, yeah, there was a couple of times I felt horrible. I was just like, oh my God, you know, anything more now, I'm just very aware uh, and, and really trying to, but, you know, it's funny when you mention this because, um, 
you know, we talk about compassion and, you know, this guy's like, Hey, I want to put them in the pasture. Right. And I just want to look at them. And I think like sometimes the pendulum can swing the other way. And, you know, there's a, a book by the Dalai Lama called the art of happiness. Um, and you may have read this, but he talks about compassion as not being a doormat, right? Actually really truly being compassionate is very courageous because you're going to have to start talking about what people need, not what they want. And that may not be exactly in alignment with what <laughs> quote they want. Right. Absolutely. So, yeah. So could we talk about compassion more? Cause this is another problem that I've had this problem. You see it a lot with writers. And I think it also has to do with women of a certain age, but you know, we have this experience. Maybe we've gone to one of your clinics or somebody else's and we go, Oh my God. And then, right. Then it's all, it's all this, it's all hands off. I get the too polite is, is the phrase that, you know, has been thrown at me more than a few times, but can you talk a little bit about, and is compassion one of the five elements actually? Um, yeah. Um, so the elements, the elements of horsemanship, I'll just tell you. And actually yeah. there, there's seven that I put in the book, okay. um, breathing, centering, grounding, and energy. Okay. And then awareness, mindfulness, and blending. So mm. those are the things we talk about. And I mean, that man kind of had like this epiphany and was like, oh my gosh, I'll just put him in the field. But no, I'm going to send them home with so much good stuff that they can do. So they're going to have moments where they go, oh my gosh, I've done this. Okay. Flash nose bands that are too tight. I do a tack check. Every clinic I do, doesn't matter the topic. If I've got people on the horse, I'm going to do a tack check. And I'm going to share things with them they may not either know or not want to know. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I'm not a fan of the, of the flash nose band. I'll be honest. Um, a lot of time, I, I just, I'm not. But if you're going to have one, it needs to be the right um, adjustment. Well, the proper, yeah. Yeah. The, the two, yeah. So, <laughs> so yeah. Um, <laughs> if it's really cranked down tight, and then sometimes mm -hmm. I'll ask them why. And they'll say, well, because my trainer told me it has to be this way because he puts his tongue out where the bit. So then we just have a conversation about, well, let's, let's think about it from his perspective. Why do you think he might put his tongue over the bit? Because that it's not a normal behavior. So something's causing it. Is it the bit? Is it the hands, which you say very tactfully and gent gently? Um, is it the, his teeth? You know, is it the size of the bit? Is it the style of the bit? Is it the adjustment on the bridle? Like, is it stress? Is it anxiety? Is it stress? So anyways, there's a lot to that. Um, and, you know, having to tell them things, one, one of the big things that comes up that I hate telling people, but I tell them every time I was just presenting at the uh, horse expo, Tennessee horse expo in Nashville back in February, right before all this stuff hit, yeah. I was able to get, get that in uh, two other, you know, big, big venues canceled after that. But we did that one prior to having the knowledge we have now. Um, and you know, I did the tack check and the, the horse, as soon as the rider went to get on, the horse was stiff and threw its head up and all this. So mm -hmm. I asked them, wait a moment. And the saddle didn't fit. Uh, yeah, it was, it was right down on the withers. It was pinching the shoulders. Um, it was too far forward, which is super common. I was taught to put the saddle forward. I, I was, grew up riding Western. I ride several different things now, but um, mm -hmm. I grew up riding Western. I was taught that the cinch goes right up behind the elbow. Mm -hmm, that's mm -hmm. what we did which places the saddle on the shoulders so and I see that a lot in clinics it's getting much better the knowledge is getting out there that we actually need they need their whole shoulder to be free so right. we want like a hands width between the elbow and the front of the girth or cinch we want like a like the width of your palm to be able to get in there yeah. okay yeah. and get your fingers around the scalpula slide them in there and make sure it's freed up from pressure but I hate telling people their saddle doesn't fit their horse because, wow, you know, yeah. saddles are expensive and um, saddles are hard. It should be fun to get a new saddle. And it's torturous for me. It has to fit the person. It has to fit the horse. And it's really tricky. There's so much to it. So um, yeah. my, my goal is, and I tell them this, if I take something away, I'm going to give you something back. So if it's something that they've always done, I might ask them to try something different, but I'm always going to give them tools and I'm always going to send them home with a whole pocket full of things to try that we, that we worked on in the clinic that can maybe start to replace some of the places, either they had difficulty or the things that we decided maybe weren't best for their horse. I'm mm -hmm. always going to give them something. 
back. Yeah. To kind of replace that versus yeah. just walking away feeling bad. Like, yeah. you know, yeah. And I, and I, you know, it's just, it's I've just been having so many conversations about this lately too, because I think there's a convergence of just, okay, there's good horsemanship and good writing and we can call it different disciplines. We can call it by different names, but there's a foundational level of this. Right. Uh, and, um, you know, it's, uh, but people come in with these fears because it's like, I've spent 10 years, you know, studying under this particular trainer or this clinician, and we always use the flash nose band, right? You know, and then now you've come into this clinic and somebody is saying you, mm, maybe not. And I'm feeling like I have to toss away, you know, it's like I'm wrong, right? Or I'm bad. Um, so that's a really nice approach where it's like, no, it's just a different tool in your toolbox, right? You know, let's just try right. it, see how it yeah, goes. Give it a whirl, right? Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and, and it's, I, I think, kind of like adding to your, adding to your knowledge versus, um, you know, criticizing or taking away or, Absolutely. you know, yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of, there's a lot of tack involved. Um, I never have people, I never make them do anything. I, you know, my approach is, what do you think of us trying? to just maybe we just take it off and let's yeah. work with the writing piece and let's see if we can help him become quiet in his mouth. Yeah. Let, let that be our goal. And, um, you know, very often we have success and it sets him on a new path with some new information. Um, and occasionally, you know, I, I certainly have people say, well, my trainer is going to require X, Y, Z, whatever it is. Yeah. And, I, you know, I've gotten to that point in my life at my age where I'm going to call a spade a spade. I'm not going to back down from what I believe in because of my commitment to the horse. Yeah. So I will say, well, then if I were you and I was in this situation, I would talk to my trainer and explain, you know, why I feel the way I do and why I'd like to try it. If they absolutely can't be open to that, I would find somebody else. Yeah. And, and, you know, and that conversation is so important, right? Because I, I have a trainer now that, that I love, right? And I'm, like I said, I'm kind of going, I'm going, well, not kind of, I'm going down this competition path and this is new for me, right? And classical, you know, we, we, I don't want to get into that because there's a lot right. of people who go on um, classical and there's a lot of charlatans out there and I get that. Um, but that's not what I was, was training with. But but there is some things that are like, okay, there's, there are things that she would like to do. And I'm like, I'm not comfortable with that. Right. You know? Um, and she's like, okay. And you know, she totally honors that, but we talk about how, okay, we want an end result, right. You know, like maybe we want her to, you know, come up more on her back, right. Whatever it is or lower the heart. So is there a way that, that, we can discuss that I'm going to feel comfortable that maybe comes more from my, my training background. Maybe it takes a little, a little longer or she shows me and I'm comfortable with that, that, you know what I mean? Like it, it works in my toolbox, but I think that's really a, a, you know, a really, really good trainer is going to do that. And she's also curious, right? Yes, oh, yes. You know, because if it helps her or it helps, I mean, it only makes her look better. Right. So if I perform better in the show ring and, you know, get higher points and win medals, then great. You know, so. Absolutely. You know, yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. And I say, you know, I say to, to my students, you know, I ride with somebody I have, there's two people that I ride with that we never stop learning and we all need a ground person. Yes. So yeah. I feel like anybody that's really probably in any journey in life, if they can keep going forward, with a really open mind about what else is there, it's all good, yeah. right? And, yeah. and so um, I, I, I really appreciate the openness. I appreciate people being vulnerable with me yeah. and trying new things. And I would say those are the type of people drawn to my work, the ones that really say, you know, I have all this going really well, but what else is there? Or it's not going so well and I wanna, I wanna make it better. Yeah, like, like I got to do a different way or l let me go find. So at the expo, right? So you go to this big expo in Nashville and you're, I've been to like, uh, oh man, I'm really having Wine a day to day. Fair. <laughs> Wine <laughs> yeah, fair. You know, yes, because we live in the same area. Yeah. So when I go to Equine Fair, right, you're out there and you're in this big expo ring and people are coming on the bleachers and you don't know who they are, you know, and you, sure. I'm sure you get all kinds of body language and, you know, so how does that work? Like you're, you're out in this, you know, big expo type thing and you're kind of trying to get the word out or do exposition. Like, is that different from when people come to your clinic or you're working one-on-one or, 
Yeah. Like well, um, the venue, and I said Nashville, it was Murfreesboro. It was a okay. Tennessee, <laughs> Tennessee Coliseum. I went to Nashville after because I love Nashville. So <laughs> my husband <laughs> it's came still with a me. big venue. Yeah. Yeah, we yeah. had a great time. I, I yeah. just love Nashville. But anyways, it was in that area. So Equine Affair, yeah. A lot of times the conferences, whether it's uh, an equine affair or, you know, an expo, whatever it is, they will tell you ahead of time if you're teaching to the audience or you're teaching to your riders. Interesting. So sometimes the riders are just kind of a tool to use to teach to the whole audience. Mm. And then sometimes, and um, I think it was, I think it was the Tennessee Expo that actually had both. Yes, it was. So I had a few sessions where I was teaching to the audience. Mm -hmm. And then the next day, it was actually like a mini clinic for my riders that the audience was auditing. Yeah, yeah. So, and I, yeah, I've seen yeah. it too. Right. It's yeah. usually that second day and people are giving quasi private lessons, but you can, you can watch the lesson. Yeah. But they're, they're not talking to you. They're not looking at you. They're not teaching, you know, you can hear through the microphone, right? You know. Yes. Yeah. And, but I will tell you my, my first responsibility, regardless of what they're asking me to do is to yeah. take care of the horses and riders in front of me. Absolutely. Yeah. So I'll even not, I'll even go off topic. You know, like I, it happened at last equine affair. Uh, I think it was stress-free obstacles or something, right? And I asked the riders to come in in hand first, come in tacked up, ready to ride, but please let's set bridles aside and be in halter because you don't know what horses you're going to get. You don't know the experience. I mean, you do, you do to some extent because they'll apply and you can choose, mm -hmm. but until you're there, you, you might have seen a, read a resume and seen a, a, you know, a two minute video clip of a horse in person and, you know, whatever. But when you get there in that crazy environment, who knows what you're going to get. So, oh yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So I'll have people come in and just ask them, okay, first let's just walk around the arena. I'll check in with them. I'll check in with the horse. I'll meet the student. I'll meet the horse. Sometimes the horses are bouncing around cuckoo because of the environment, right? I'm not going to put somebody on because I have a curriculum to follow. Right. Okay. So we're going to take care of the horse's needs first. We're going to answer his questions. I'm going to give the handler tools to help calm the horse. And, you know, one of the first things I do with everybody, because breathing being the first element is yeah. <laughs> I want you to, I want you to walk around the arena and all I want you to do is deep breathing. I want you to just do some deep breathing as you walk around the arena. And now with the beauty of horse speak, uh, information. I put them on the outside because the protector is on the outside. So the human has to be between the horse and the fence and the people. So I make sure they're going in a direction that supports that. I give them tools to through horse speak to show them, show the horse I've got you, right? I've taken care of the whole environment. We're all set. Um, but I'm having them work on them at the same time. So I'm actually talking them through breathing, having soft eyes, allowing their body to settle down into the ground. I'm talking them almost through like a, a meditation walk as they go mm -hmm. around mm -hmm. because I need to get their heart rate down right? so that the horse's heart rate can go down so that we actually can get to whatever the topic is. So, and, and that's where we're at. I had somebody last year who came into uh I don't know what session it was. It might have been stress-free obstacle. And I usually keep it to like three riders, four at the most, because it, I, I, I want to give them everything I can and make sure I can pay attention to them all and keep everybody safe. And it was the horse's first time off the farm. Oh. And they brought them to equine affair. <laughs> wow. Wow. You know, it's, I, I, you know, talk about epic. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> oh, oh my gosh. Wow. Needless to say, wow. that, wasn't, that wasn't part of the resume, right? No. So, <laughs> and I'm like, okay. Um, so I actually, I think I had the, the um, I think I had that person get on last once I felt they were ready and their horse was ready. And um, they kind of hung out in the middle with me for a little bit and we just let things settle. So yeah, a big part of my teaching, if you remember the 75-25 rule I mentioned, yep. we have to take care of us 
because that's the first and best way we can take care of our horse. Um, there was, I don't know if you know this, it was in my book, but there was a fascinating study done in Sweden about the heart rate, how a human heart rate affects a horse's heart rate. Yeah, yeah. And I've also, you know, the Heart Math Institute, right? And they talk about where the horse is, I'm going to do the hand thing. I got some feedback. Your hands are always going, but I'm going to yes, do it. Yes, yes, It's out here, but like <laughs> people kind of be like this, but the thing is when those two intersect, right? And then our heart rate is like way faster than a horse's. And so they're like, what, what, you know, what are you freaking out about? Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Let me give you this little snippet because it's so interesting. So they set up um, 20, 20 different horses and 10 different handlers of all okay. ages, ability, the horses, all breeds, ages, so it, uh, you know, all different levels and handlers um, swapped horses around. Okay. And they, and this was just in hand leading. They gave them this exercise where they set up two cones and at, at the further cone was somebody standing with an umbrella that was closed. And they said, the third time you pass by this cone with the umbrella, it's going to pop up. So they're leading the horses by and they measured the heart rate of the human and the heart rate of the horse. And in every single case in hand and then again under saddle with every horse and every human combination, the heart rate was up with the horse, the heart rate was up with the human and the umbrella never opened. The, so the third time it never happened. It just was never like happened. the expectation of it. Wow. Yes. Wow. Yes. So um, I, I think I even put that in the book because I, um, and I shouldn't say I think, I'm so sorry. I wrote it four years ago. It's like, <laughs> yeah, I think it's in there somewhere. <laughs> I talk about it all the time and I talk about it in all the clinics. So sometimes things just kind of blend together. Um, <clears throat> but I say that because I, it's so eye-opening and this was many years ago, it's so eye-opening to help people understand the importance of getting themselves regulated because it really does affect our horse. And some horses are, you know, so tuned in and they're electric and reactive to it. Some are introverted, but it affects them the some, same way, right? Some are just, they're really pretty level and it doesn't, it doesn't get them too troubled. Um, so anyways, I always start with the human, no matter what the environment yeah. is. <laughs> well, I mean, I think the reason why I asked was, you know, because you do get kind of all kinds. And I know like sometimes they, you know, they, you apply, but you don't really know, you know, what's going on. And, uh, right. um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of those bigger environments. What are interesting to me is that you're teaching a concept, like you said, it's, it's a lot more about me than it is really the horse, right? But you're at an equine affair and expo. Um, and you're trying to show that, uh, and then you've got this audience and, you know, so I'm just kind of wondering, like, you know, do you, do you get an audience that's kind of skeptical? Do you notice over the hour when you're doing the demo that people are beginning to like lean in or they're coming down to the rail or, you know, like that kind of thing, or they come up and talk to you or, I mean, how does that, you know, cause that's a very different energy where, you know, okay, I'm paying to go to a clinic. I'm going, cause I really want to work with Heidi, right? You know, I read her book. I'm so, oh, I'm so inspired. So I have that kind of interest level, but you know, at the expo, it's just everybody, right? Yeah, um, that's a great question. And you never know when you have an audience out there, of course, who's gonna be sitting there and what they're gonna be thinking. I've reached a point in my life and in my career where I'm just really focused and true to my objective, which is keeping the horses and the riders safe yeah. Making sure I do fun, safe, and effective, right? The three rules of any lesson. It's got to yeah. be fun. Um, it's got to be safe. And it has to be effective. And I've always gotten to topic. Sometimes I run out of time. I wanted to, I always have more than I can possibly fit in. That's true. Clinics and everything, you know, like you always have an agenda this long and reality yeah. is you get through <laughs> as much of it, yeah. which is good, which is probably good because yeah. it probably would have been a fire hose situation if you had a blast and threw it all. Um, uh, I, I mean, a really good example for those of you listening, if you haven't looked into horse speak, if you have anything to do with horses, no matter what it is, if you're a volunteer at a therapeutic riding center or you're a body worker or you're a high level competitor or you're a backyard pleasure rider, you need to know horse speak. And it was, it was founded by Sharon Wilsey. And I think Betsy had Sharon on her show maybe I a week or did. so ago. Yeah. Um, yes, yeah. I'm part of the, the horse speak team. I've been working with Sharon for three years and, uh, as a senior instructor, I'm the only other person like sharing this information and teaching it. And the, real, the reality is once you learn it, you can't take it away. 
Like, yeah. I'm like, I have to apply it because I know it and it works and you can't take it away. It's actually figuring out um, a really effective way based on what is natural to horses and within the herd, how to understand and read them on a way deeper level than you could ever imagine, and then how to communicate back to them in a way that's meaningful to them. Um, I can't say enough, check it out. We have lots of fantastic webinars. Um, there's courses, it's so inexpensive for, you know, 30, 35 bucks, you can, you can yeah. watch the webinar over and over and over again. You get a study guide. Um, they have a horse beat club now, right? Oh, I think I saw month. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Two hour Tuesdays. You get two hours every Tuesday with Sharon to watch live videos. People send in videos. She narrates what's going on with their horses. And then there's questions and answers. Like, anyways, fabulous work. So I'll get back on topic. Oh, um, no, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> with uh, Equine Affair last year. Um, you talked about sometimes what people think. Do you have skeptics? Absolutely. We run into it all the time, especially with that type of work, because mm -hmm. this is brand new. People, it's not that nobody ever knew this stuff, but in my opinion, Sharon was the first one to put it into a teachable, learnable format. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the way it's being practiced is new. So this horse that's, you know, a, a student came in with this thoroughbred at Equine Affair, thoroughbreds on their tiptoes. The human has you know, their oh. hand underneath oh. the chin, choked yeah. up on the reins, right under the bit, and the horse is like, yang, 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 and their head is up. The, the person, God bless her, was scared. The yeah. horse was terrified, and it was a big horse. And I'm like, Whew. so when you are really empathetic, you're feeling, right, you're getting your feeling from the horse. They're transmitting that to you. Um, most, uh, I think everybody has it. It's just how open to you are. Are, are you to receiving it? When you look at that, for me, my chest closes up, my breathing stops. Like I just get like, oh my gosh, I have to help because I can't feel this way and do my job. Right. So the horse is, the tension is just wicked. So in horse speak, we do something that's called securing the environment and blowing away the boogeyman. So if we relate it to horses, the sentry horse is always looking, you know, looking out across the pasture, looking in the woods, right? They're, they're on sentry. And then there may be horses grazing in a field and there's a noise and the lead horse or the sentry horse picks their head up. And if it's really something, they'll go, Whoo! they'll make that blow noise, which is what is referred to as a sentry breath, blowing sentry, blowing away the boogie man. Okay. That's what we refer to it as in horse speak. And then after you do that, if you notice horses, when that horse decides the coast is clear, they put their head down and graze and all the other horses put their heads down and they all start grazing. It's like, okay, the all clear, you see it, we acknowledged it, it's no big deal, let's go back to grazing. So we take those principles. So we're in equine affair, horse is hot. I actually ask if I can take the horse in my hands because I need to, I need to help the human reset and I need to get the horse relaxed and that's not gonna happen when they're connected because they're both scared. Well, you kind of got that feedback loop going on yeah. between the two of them, yeah. right? Yeah. So I wanted mm -hmm. to give her a break and give her some tools. And then I also wanted to take the horse and demonstrate and help her know what to do. So I had the other people walking on the outside and I had this horse in my hands. I said, we're going to walk around the outside, on the outside of the horse, between the horse and the audience and the arena walls. And we're going to kick the fence posts and we're going to jiggle the, the, the panels of the round pen that they put around it. And um, if the horse looks at something like somebody's walking by with a baby stroller and the yeah. horse is like, what's that? You know, they do the snort. Then you stop and you can point at it, look at it. If it's a big deal, you blow out a breath. You can even say, hey, you stop, stop with that baby carriage right now. Okay. Now, the reason we do that is not because the horse knows the words. It's because we become believable. And it's energetically like, oh, I'm, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yes. So when we bring up the kind of energy and we vocalize our intention, we're believable to the horse. So they know if we're congruent or not. We need to be congruent. Our insides have to match our outsides. They know if we're faking it. Mm -hmm. So by doing that and then going, <sighs> taking a breath, relaxing your shoulders, shaking it off, letting out that that little noise that they make when they're releasing stress and just relaxing. And then we lick and chew and we walk on. You will be blown away by the response you get from horses doing this. Okay. So I thought I got to go there. 
even with hundreds of people watching, they are going to think I'm out of my mind. I have to go there because it works. And it is my best tool to help show this horse that we got it. We've got this crazy environment. We can keep you safe. We've got you. So everybody is walking around and there's somebody walking on crutches. And I'm like, hey, you with the crutches. <laughs> you yeah, right the now. <laughs> Literally. I'm like, oh you my sit God. down right now. <laughs> Were they like, what? <laughs> yes, exactly. And the people look at me like, she's crazy, right? <laughs> and then I nod, thank you. <sighs> and then I go walking on my merry way. The horse drops their head, their ears go floppy. They let out a big sigh within, I'm going to say less than 10 minutes. I had this big thoroughbred in my hand in the middle of the arena, head down, ears floppy, breathing, eyes soft, done. Yeah. And the audience is like, what just happened there, right? What just yeah. happened? And meanwhile, some of them are saying, you're crazy. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. But it works. It's undeniable. And we're getting so much feedback now. We have a, a pilot program of instructors. We're working with 12 people that are going through our first, our first program. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's just, we're doing as much as we can to get this out there. And the results, the responses, the stories are, you know, heartwarming and it is amazing. So you literally can pick up the book. I think you said you did that. You can read a yeah. few things, go try it and it works. Yeah. And, and I've been doing that like since, since uh, Sharon and Laura and I talked, um, I've been doing some of those things and you're right about, you cannot go back from that. I mean, I think one, because I, you know, the first, I, I think I even said in the interview, like when, you know, when I, I call it the fist bump, I know I'm not supposed to call it the fist oh, bump, greeting, but I do the fist greeting. bump, the, the greeting, greeting hand, the <laughs> greeting hand, you know, and you all of a sudden it's like, you get this response because they're, you know, and it's so much easier. And so it's almost like addictive because you want to learn more and you want the quality of that conversation to be richer. Right. And then I think it's also, you, the horse can't go back honestly, because it's like, well now, you know, Oh, well it, it you know, I guess it be analogous is like, I walk up to you, you only speak Spanish. I start speaking Spanish and you're like, Oh my God, thank God she speaks my language. And then I'm like, Nope, I'm just going to speak English now forget it exactly you can't the you know so uh yeah there's been a lot of and it is you can just take the book and i've been doing that and you know and just it experimenting with different things uh but the thing that i found with it is um it goes back to a lot of the stuff kind of in the old masters right and you know certain positions and the way that you launch and where you put the whip to do so and it's all those buttons I mean, it's crazy. And then, you know, energetically yes. it's, you know, and they, and they talk about it in a different way. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it's, as I'm talking about this and, you know, we, you know, the codification and just generously giving that out. Right. So I'm at an expo and I'm going to show you how to bring down the craziness for free. Right. You know, then that's somebody, somebody can imitate. Um, I had a really interesting question uh, from somebody today. I was talking to you and watched uh, Sharon's interview and I'm curious your point of view on this. But they had asked me, they said, okay, so do you think that this is something that nobody's ever codified or is it something that trainers have known for a long time or certain trainers or gurus or whatever you want to call them, masters, and they intentionally didn't tell their students because then they kind of lose that guru-ness, right? You know? Yeah. So curious to your point, point of view on that. <clears throat> yeah. I think the real, I can't speak for all of them, but yeah. many, many people that are masterful with horses do it innately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. we can go back and watch them. We can watch some of the masters. And now because of the, it was 13 buttons in the first book. Now third book's coming out. There's actually 15 buttons now. Yeah. Um, you can watch how these masters, let's say it's a Liberty session, Frederick Pignon. Yep. Right? Yeah. Masterful, amazing, just brilliant, beautiful work watching him with a horse he knows where his core is he knows where his energy is his expression he, is welcoming yeah. he may send energy in certain areas we can now say it's at that button yeah um i think a lot of times what happens is they innately these really masterful people innately get feedback from the horse and they're connected in a horse and they know where to push and where to pull energetically 
mm -hmm. um, or with a, or in hand with a rein in one hand and a whip in the other. It doesn't matter. The buttons are getting work. I don't believe anyone's ever referred to them as buttons before. Uh, that's Sharon's coined phrase. And it's just a really easy way to help people understand. Um, are there really masterful people who just want to keep some secrets? Could be, but I think it's, I think it's two things. I think there are really amazing masters who maybe aren't good teachers. True. Yeah. Okay. And we see that in everything. Just because, yeah. just because you're brilliant doesn't mean you can teach it. Yep. And that's not a slight. It's just a thing. It's just a yeah. reality. So sometimes they can say, you know, watch me, I do this, but they don't either have the ability or the words to say how and why they're doing what they're doing. Exactly. So yeah. then you have, it's open to interpretation and you try to copy and mimic without really having the knowledge you need. So I think that, I think that happens a lot. Like the real masters, um, like I said before, it's not like all the information I'm sharing or Sharon is sharing is all brand new and nobody ever knew it before. Um, I think we're sharing it in a different way. You know, when I bring in these, these centered writing philosophies of Sally's or, you know, I go down my own path of sharing what worked for me in my horsemanship. Um, you know, an example of my horse, Riley, my Cheval Canadian, who really lacks confidence. And years ago, he taught me I, what, I, what I refer to in the book as the 10 breath rule. He is, he's very stoic. He's a very introverted horse. He's a cold-blooded, what I would call a cold blood. So he's not like an Arab or a thoroughbred or a Morgan. He's not like, dee, 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 dee. eyes are rolling back in the head. I'm scared. I'm scared. I'm big. I'm tall. I'm tight. I'm going to run, spin, buck and bolt. He's not that guy. He's the mm -hmm. guy that freezes. And I rode him yesterday and I, we went out on a trail that ended up on a road with a house. But, and I don't know. <laughs> the horse they eating house. <laughs> chickens in the woods. There was a house with chickens and pigs and dogs or whatever. <sighs> so scared I could feel his heart pounding underneath oh, wow. my body. Wow. Frozen. Frozen in fear. And I've worked with him since he was a two-year-old and, and he became mine when he was nine. Pretty much because of his personality. Sweet, lovely, wonderful, but born scared born mm. scared um not of like obstacles in the arena stuff like that but of life things out you know it's the garbage can in the woods that wasn't there yesterday or maybe it was i don't know so i realized with him there's no amount of pressure that you could put on him to make him go right okay and he actually with his previous owner did go to one trainer who who did a lot mm. a lot of pressure on him and when she decided she had to sell and downsize we talked about Riley a lot and I actually took him to my house because I was, I loved this horse and I was terrified. We definitely had a connection. I was terrified of who may have him. Yeah. Because I, I thought there's this term called stubborn. People refer to horses yeah. as stubborn. I don't yes. believe that is true. I don't believe that's a thing. And they could beat this horse, this horse, you could draw blood on this horse and not, he wouldn't move. Right. So there's right. no amount of pressure, absolutely no amount of pressure in the world, in existence, that will make him move until he feels safe. And I was really afraid for him. So I came up with the 10 breath rule. And it was anytime he freezes, I'm not going to, I'm not going to start kicking on him. I'm not going to encourage him forward. I'm not going to tap him. I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to sit and breathe because all he needs is time. He needs me to have a way to show him that it's okay. And I could always get off and do it, but I need to not get off every time either. And yeah, get <laughs> I mean, sometimes, sometimes yeah. I do if I have to, but I want to get it solved under, under saddle. So I'm going to sit and breathe and it's training for me. Yeah. No, yeah. I'm not training my horse. I'm training myself to say, okay, he stopped because he's afraid. I'm going to sit and breathe. And I will just sit and take really deep breaths and exhale audibly. It's great for me. So instead of getting, oh, frustrated or whatever about what's happening, that all goes away because you're resetting yourself. You're calming yourself emotionally, mentally, physically. And almost always, by the time I get to the fifth or sixth breath, he goes, ha, ah, that's a trash can. And off we go. Nice. This takes nice. him longer. Yeah. Than some horses and he's more fearful than some horses. Um, and it got better and better and better once I stopped pushing on him and pushing on him never worked anyways. So 
Yeah. yeah. That's well, and it's, it's just like people though, honestly, you know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. But the breath work is so interesting because we keep going back to, it's the breath work. It's the breath, you know, and that, that is your first, you know, five elements. So that's so essential, right? Because you can't, I don't think you, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think you can get through the other four or the seven without the breath, right? You know, I just, you can't. Yeah. So is that kind of like a scale of, uh, well, it feels like that it's a scale of kind of, you know, a higher, um, I don't want to say awareness, but maybe an energy level or a groundedness, right, where you get into that blending, right, which yeah. I'm assuming is, can you talk blending a little bit of, you know, that, I mean, obviously, it's the highest level, I'm not trying to be ambitious here, but yeah. what does yeah. blending mean? Is that energetic blending? Is it blending where you really do have that kind of centaur effect that you're really feeling like we're all one, like what, what, what would be that kind of feel in your, in your language? What would that be? Um, I would say energetically, it's kind of physical, mental, and emotional. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's, it's how we get to develop feel. It's how we get to achieve lightness. It's through the blending of the energies and thinking of it from an energetic standpoint, I'm going to lift the horse up. If you're lunging, lift up mm -hmm. your body. It's not about get the whip busy. It's about be congruent. What have you done in your body to commun commun communicate to the horse who's, who reads your body language yeah. to tell him, do what I'm doing. Join me, join me in motion, really yeah. join me in motion. So blending those energies, we, if we want to slow down the horse, we slow down ourselves. If we want to yeah. speed up the horse, we lift ourselves. So once we start to do that, we achieve this harmony that we're all seeking. We're seeking harmony on all three of those levels, right? Mental, emotional, physical. And the blending comes from the self-awareness. It comes from your ability to control your body, your position, be aware, um, know what you're putting out there. And we, we can't help, like we can't stop ourselves from being startled just like a horse can't. Right. And when we get startled, we're gonna go, <gasps> like no matter any amount of training you have, you know, maybe at some point you get there, but if somebody jumps out around the corner, Oh, you're so right. Like, right? <laughs> yeah, now, yeah. Your, your lizard brain's going to fire off, right? Your fight right. or flight is going to ignite. It's going to happen. It's just, then how do you deal with it? How mm -hmm. quickly do you respond? If you have training, you might have a response that happens really quickly. Right. And yourself. Um, however, it's that, it's just that ability to come back to yourself and be mm -hmm. really grounded and be really aware. Um, and I bring that into a lot of the, a lot of the clinic curriculum, especially in this day of cell phones and distraction. Oh, yeah. 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 Cause it's, it's just, you're just like all the time. Right. And you know, I've, I've totally been guilty of that. And I think then too, there's also, I mean, we can go on for hours about this, but you know, I'm sure now that people kind of, they have the, uh, what is it? FOBO, fear of being offline, right? So yeah, that kind of, oh, where's my phone? Like, oh, I should go check it out. You know, I mean, like, you know, you know, yeah. to get another like on my Instagram post, I need to know right now, you know, and, and so it's, it's like harder and harder to kind of, you know, cause I, what you're describing is like, you know, I've, uh, you know, flow state, right. You know, I, I, we use a lot of different language for that. Uh, but so question I have for you then when we're in that, right, we're talking about our 75, 25. And so 75 is you, right? Is there a time though, where the horse is influencing that 75, right? So is there a feedback loop where, you know, I might come in, I'm chill, I'm good. And my horse is not in that place. Um, and then it, it more subtly creeps up on you versus like they startle and you startle. It's more, now why I'm all of a sudden and cranky or I'm not feeling, I'm feeling uncomfortable or something like that. So have you, is there a reverse of this or? In terms of your focus on mm -hmm. what, how you're going to respond. So absolutely what you just described absolutely happens, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, that the horse may be in a particular mood. Maybe they're cranky or maybe they're scared. Um, we have to still not be judgmental about it. We have to right. be accepting of meeting them where they are. And that still is going to take us working on us because we yeah. might have this grand plan and we're on the clock and we have one hour and yeah. our horse sees us marching across the field with a halter. And they're like, yeah, see ya. 
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Your whole intention, I don't want none of that, right? Right, like, right. Oh man, now he's running away, right? Like, so it's still all about us. Is there a situation where we turn it to be all about them? Well, I mean, it is all about them, but I mean, in right. terms of how we manage it, um, we're always going to manage ourselves first. Mm -hmm. So we may need to do the thing with the horse, okay? Yeah. We need to clean his hooves. We may need to give him a shot. We may need to deworm him, okay? Um, we still have to check ourselves because what happens with us is we start to already premeditate it's going to be a problem. And then whether we did that or not, and it is a problem, then our mind can get stuck in, okay, now this is a problem, or this is where he's going to throw his head up, pull back, do X, Y, Z. Yeah. So again, we have to work on ourselves. Um, with all the tools we have, with taking care of ourselves and the breathing, centering, groundness, awareness, if we add in some horse speak principles, chances are we're going to turn that right around. Mm -hmm. And we're going to help that horse get to where we need to get to. Um, I also do clicker training. I have positive reinforcement training. That's in my book. I've done that for years and years and years. I will say that is probably one of my top two tools to getting something done if, if, if the horse is really resistant due to trauma yeah. or fear, um, a, a fear memory, a, a severe injury memory, trauma, anything like that where the horse is really stuck in the trauma. And mm -hmm. no matter all the time and, you know, softness in the world, whatever it is, everything you brought to the table isn't going to get it done. Yeah. Clicker training for me <clears throat> is where I go. So you might say that, well, so that might be an example or we, where we put more attention on the horse. Yeah. And you know, it's funny. I smiled when you mentioned the clicker training because I, I do clicker training on and off. Like I started because uh, my mare was, um, she was very frightened of things and very reactive. Um, and, uh, but the thing that I liked about it, cause I had done it with, with dogs and it's, 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 you know, teach tricks. Right. And it's just operate. Uh, operant conditioning, right? So if you right. go to, you know, again, I'm, I don't want to get into debate about SeaWorld, but if you go to like SeaWorld or whatever, I mean, they use clicker training, right? Yeah. Uh, but it, um, uh, they, uh, the thing that I liked about it is, again, and it goes back, I think, to this martial arts, Eastern philosophy principle, you really have to slow it down. You have to break it down very tiny bits. And so your expectation level is, uh, you know, I mean, I used it really successfully. I have to put ointment in her eye, right? Sure. Yes. Um, and just literally just, right. But I mean, I had to, can I get my, you know, can, can you, if I go like this and hold the thing, you know, five inches from your face, are you going to go freaky on me? Click, right? So the first time it took, and it took an hour to put ointment in her eye. But again, I think because you're going in with that mindset, and maybe I'm just saying what you just said is, I go in with that mindset of this is probably going to take a long time because it's the first time I'm using the clicker and I have to break this into tiny pieces. So it's going to take as long as it's going to take. And I just left that two hours that night. Like it made me take two hours, but so the goal, the orientation is way tinier, right? And it's way slower, but it happens much more quickly uh, versus me grabbing the halter and ranking down and going, okay, we're going to put the ointment in and, you know, and she's doing this, you know, the yeah. standard stuff. Right. Um, uh, so, yeah, but, but on the other hand, the other thing that I found with a clicker training is the click can be replaced with a, you know, ah, or good, or, you know, as long as you're using that. Um, <laughs> and I still use that with her. Right. Uh, and she knows immediately if I, if I say, ah, then we're like, oh, okay, we're good. Right. So that whole argument of, oh, you always have to have the clicker. I'm like, mm, not exactly. I, yeah. yeah, I agree. And, um, I've got quite a good segment in the book about this to teach yeah. people. Um, and there's a little trick. You can teach them how to smile. Our horses in the barn, you can't even itch your head, but they're all smiling because <laughs> the, cue, the cue is waving your finger in front of them, right? Oh, I, oh, so I have to go, try smile, that. Yeah. And it comes from beginning of tickling their whiskers. And then you, you move the cue back to just a little hand up, wiggle, smile. Yeah. And then they do the Fleming response, which is natural. And then click treat. So yeah. now, yeah, you can't, if you pick up a camera, you've got a couple of them smiling because any motion up here means smile. Yeah. Um, However, uh, it's, I don't use, I, I, I learned clicker training with a clicker from somebody who studied with um, Alexandra Curland, and I've also studied yeah. 
Karash's work, two of the pioneers in, in clicker training with horses, right? Yeah. Um, I've never used, I had it once when I learned it, I had a clicker. That's my click. I exactly. use that cluck noise with my tongue. It's the only thing I ever use it for. I always have it with me. I'm never going to hold a clicker thing. I do clinics. I do clicker training clinics. I do mm. problem solving clinics, which can incorporate different different types of positive reinforcement, but clicker training's one. If I, if we really need exactly. it, get in. Yeah. Um, what I find is there's no quicker or more fun way to help a horse through something that they're having difficulty with. So I approach the whole thing with let's play a game. Yeah. Yeah. Let's play a game. So once you teach them and I, and I talk about in the book, how to teach them the clicker training. And the second thing you teach them is don't mug me. And I have that in there as well. Yep, because yeah. some horses will, you know, once they know you're a vending machine, then they're going to frisk you for it, right? Put their mouth. Oh, on oh you. yeah, 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 yeah. yeah so yeah. I, even, <laughs> I have in the book, the second lesson is don't mug me. Yep. Um, and most horses, it takes just a very few minutes to teach them to take their head away. Yeah. And then you click and treat when the head goes away and you offer the treat away from your body, not yep. on you. You're never yeah. saying here, come put your nose on me and get food. You're yeah. saying take your head away and here's your treat and, and you can hold out for it. So I, you know, you could be working on a hind leg that they're, maybe they're a little kicky or they're tight or they don't want to lift and they do it. You can cluck, be cleaning the hind foot, maybe click a second or cluck a second time and then go up to the front of the horse and they'll turn their head away and then they get their treat. I mean, it literally yeah. can be like that. So I find it really fast. You change the brain, you change the whole association with whatever the problem was. Um, yeah, I really love it, but I'm really firm about having to know um, the process and understand the philosophy behind. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, or yeah. Or you this can is, create a you dangerous, can create a monster, like a total monster, right? Yeah, and yeah, and you know, and yeah, and I would say that in my experience, just you know, having doing behavioral training with dogs, um, and I, and again, I only did it for tr trick training, um, so it it's uh it's definitely an advanced thing you know it's not you know, yes. it's so funny because it gets blasted as like a shortcut or you know being lazy and all this and i'm like actually it's it's far more difficult um and your timing has to be super on right you know and then breaking everything down um but yeah i don't i don't think clicker training is for beginners <laughs> not by no. a long shot, you and, know uh, so, yeah yeah i think all you know one of the things that that i like to to share with people is consider your horse's learning like you would a child's because yeah. it's not that different. Like, you know, maybe you had a parent that threw you off the end of the dock to teach you how to swim. <laughs> yes. That happens. But yes. hopefully you had someone maybe that got your toes wet and then they got you in further and they taught you how to stick your face in the water and blow bubbles. And then when it was time to float, they supported you under your belly so you could float and not sink, you know? So it's the same type, um, to me, it's, it's that same type of thought process and compassion and, you know, sympathy for the situation. You want it to be successful, um, breaking it down into small pieces and making it fun and making it easy yeah. and not forcing yeah. it. And we use positive reinforcement with humans. It's what we do. You know, the child yeah. does the right thing. We can say good job and that's really meaningful or give them a hug or, they get an M&M &M or they get to go with their friends yeah. or stay up late and watch an extra special movie that night. I mean, we have all these tools, but we're using them with humans and we can really effectively use them with horses, but it, it just is going to be a little different. Yeah. Well, and you know, and it's, it's to getting, you know, kind of back to the whole, right. In the beginning we talked about, I think people come in with, it's a big animal. They move very quickly. There's a fear, there's an anxiety. Um, I think there's an age component, right? Um, Cause the other thing too, you know, I was reflecting when you were talking about younger people and I was like, yeah, we just want to go fast and have adrenaline. But there's also um, oddly considering that teenage girls have so many hangups about their self image and the 20 year old women do. Uh, there doesn't seem to be as, this kind of fierce feeling of looking stupid or being embarrassed. And I, you know, maybe that's just a lack of life experience or right. You haven't been humiliated or embarrassed in different, like, you know, in your career or whatever, uh, dating and stuff like that. Like not to the degree when you come in and you're in your forties. Right. So, um, you know, maybe, maybe it's some of that as well. Right. Um, where it's, I don't know, you know, 
it's it's all very there's a lot of threads of the carpet there so to is. speak yeah there yeah is. and it's super fun to 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 blend them all together yes yeah really yeah. it's so it's so interesting and and we never stop learning i mean i hope i keep learning till the day i die and boy the horses are going to teach us you know you're always doesn't matter how many tools you have you're always going to run into that horse that says you got what else you got you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, <laughs> so, yeah, just when you think you know, right? You oh, know, and you're gonna um, get humbled. <laughs> yeah, I had a. I'll tell a little funny story because I actually I think Kat and I may have talked about it on the episode, but you know, she she studied with a maestra and um, you know, very well known guy, and riding stallions all the time, right? You know, and and she comes out and we have a little clinic at the barn, and she's like, oh, you know, and doing some work with my mare and. And she's like, oh, do you mind if I ride your girl? And I'm kind of like, sure. Because <laughs> you know, I kind of know what's going to happen, right? And we sit down and she gets on and my horse is like, I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going. And, she, and my horse is very hot tempered, right? But she just stood there and she just put her head up like this. And she's like, I'm not going anywhere. And, you know, Kat's trying to be as tactful, but also, you know, kind of, ratcheting up like as Sharon would call it my you know my intensity level without being like right but it's like hello 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 right and she's like yeah no no you know and then she's take one step back <laughs> and this went on for like 20 minutes right oh so, wow oh yeah yeah no I mean you know it was kind of the end and everybody clapped when Dory took like four steps forward and Kat's <laughs> like okay thank you so much she got off but you know we were laughing haha because it was kind of funny but on the other hand Kat was like I was like I kind of felt bad but on the other, one hand I was laughing on the other hand I felt bad but Kat's like no this was really good for me because you know, it's a new lesson to learn. Like I have never had this happen, right? You know, never had a horse do this, right? So, you know, and you would think, um, because, you know, of course we make all kinds of assumptions, stereotypes is like, here's this person who's a working student and writing all these, you know, very, you know, fine and loses on stallions and everything else that, you know, my mare would be a piece of cake and, and not so much, right? So they always got, always got something in their bag of tricks to do. They yeah. send us back to the drawing board for sure. Yeah. 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 I have one of those. Do you have one of those right now? Yeah. 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 He sends me back. He's like, what else you got? And I have to tell you, it's so much of it comes from us. So much of it comes from what do we have to change? Yeah. And I think it's the fears and insecurities and all of the, the stuff that we wrap in our heads, right? That actually have nothing to do with horses, honestly, right? So you come into the barn and it's all about, I mean, because I don't know how many times I've gotten in the truck and crying on the way home and like, oh. Oh, you, know, I, you know, I can't even make my horse trot, you know, and like, Duh, you know, and I couldn't do this at work and this didn't work out and I'm fat and ugly and oh my God, life is horrible, right? And you go all the way down that path, right? Like, like that. <laughs> I'm sure people know that feeling, right? So, you know, it's just, it's, it's, you know, it's hard to come into the barn then you know, or come into a clinic and then have to really unwind that. So I love that whole 75 in, in the, the, you know, the, the elements that come from that Eastern philosophy, because all of those things that you talked about is really about getting your own stuff together, right? It's about getting out of your own head. And, yeah, and yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I, I really encourage people to be kind to themselves, to be yeah. patient, to be patient with themselves, to be forgiving with themselves. Um, not try to worry about image. Don't worry about what other people think. Um, you know, bring their best self to the horse and you can be really open with the horse. You don't always have to be happy. You're not always happy. You know, they don't yeah. care if you're happy or sad. They just, they care if you're congruent. Yeah. And I think it's really important for people to have empathy for themselves and go where they can, not where they can't, or do what they can, not what they can't. If they're not in a good in a good headspace, find a way to just share some quality time. Can you just have an enrichment session with your horse? Because if you can, it's going to feel really good to you, and it's going to feel really good to them. Um, one of the things people come up against, at least people, I do consultations over the phone. 
um, especially now during COVID. But yeah. um, anytime, if somebody's having a problem, they can call. Um, we can set up a Zoom session. I can watch videos that they, you know, we can watch videos together to problem solve. We can do a lot just talking. Um, I can give them lots of tools and imagery. Um, but I think just realizing where they're at and accepting where they're at and going there. And one of the things that I hear from people is other people in their barn are judging them or they don't understand yes. or they're not yes. embracing. Maybe, you know, these people now want to go th down a different path and yeah. the people that are in their barn aren't there or they're, they're different. Their horsemanship style is different. Yeah. Yeah. I just have to say always to them, your first responsibility is to yourself and your horse. Yeah. Yeah. So do your own thing. If it's not allowed or acceptable, or you're being told you have to do something, you're your horse's keeper. All they have is you. So then you have to change. You have to change the environment. You have to, you have to make the hard decision to go somewhere else. I mean, we have to be their advocate, right? Yeah, so exactly. Yeah, that's how we get to sleep at night. And that's how we know we've done the right thing. Maybe we didn't win the gold medal, but we did the right thing for our horse. And therefore, we're going to go home feeling okay. Yeah. You shouldn't, you shouldn't feel like a failure if you're do, bringing your best self and you're doing your best. And, you know, in horse agility, one of the things I love about Vanessa B's rules for the club in England is that it's really simple. The rules are it must be fun. And it must be safe for you and your horse. It must be, no, it must be safe and it must be fun for you and your horse. Yeah. It's not about getting, it's not about getting the job done. So when we judge horse agility competitions and they have a great online thing, you can send it in and get, you know, you get your scores from England, you get ribbons from England, you get judged oh, in, cool. your, in, your, in your country as well as in the world, you get placed. So oh, it's neat. really fun. Yeah. Um, you won't find live competitions through the club anyways you know there just mm. aren't enough of them in this country but what I love about it is when we judge it we were more active years ago when it came out and I had different organizations and groups come in and we did this um, and I do clinics in it which I will do a competition at the end on the last day just for fun bring your horse it's all in hand obstacles and it could be at liberty if you're there um, and you go through 10 obstacles on the ground right um, what I loved about it and what really got me hooked on, on this style of this practice was 50% of your score is based on your horsemanship mm. and 50% is based on the technique. And I don't know other, any other equine sport in the industry that puts that much focus on how happy is the horse? How was your relationship with your horse? How did he respond to you and you respond to him? Was it in a healthy, positive way? Yeah. So whips, you know, sticks, whips, flags and ropes aren't even allowed in competition. You're always wow. working towards liberty. So yeah. you might need a stick for training. You know, it's not to say when you're training, if you need an extension of your arm, you can't have it. But it's about stripping everything away so you're communicating with your body, your energy, your expression to your horse on a, on a soft lead line. We say there must be a smile in the rope. Yeah, yeah. So, so there's a, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so here's the thing. You're going through the obstacle course. We're, we're scoring it um, one to five. On your horsemanship how do you guys working together and one to five on the technique anytime the rope gets taut so the lead line gets taut so that there's any halter pressure at all there's a minus point on the horsemanship score oh wow wow so right. even though they do like a clean round or clean obstacle you could get really undercut with bad well not bad yes. horsemanship but yeah, yeah. And yeah. it's not to say you're bad. And I tell everybody yeah. before, the, before the competition, I say, you're just starting this. You're going to get little TRs. And I actually take off one point. I don't do it one point for up, you know. Yeah. If, if, it, get, if, it, got if it got tight three times on one obstacle, I'm only going to do it once. It's a one point, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to yeah. write TR for tight rope. And okay. they're going to get the sheet back and they're going to see TRs. Everybody right. does because you haven't worked on using your hand to draw the horse to you and your energy. How's your breath on your halt? Did you just let out a breath and sink into your feet? Yeah. You know, so once you start working this, this kind of blending with your horse, they're all in because that's what they do with each other. They don't lead each other around on halters and lead lines. No, they no. On each yeah. other's faces. So and they don't have is, whips and sticks. <laughs> <laughs> so this yeah. is their language. This is their language. So 
it's really fascinating because we give people the tools so they can be really successful at this. And it's really fun. And at Liberty, if you're competing in Liberty and the horse walks away, you laugh. It yeah. doesn't matter. Yeah. And it's not timed. So anyway, yeah. nice. if you Google it, horse agility, if it's not through the club in England and it's timed or they can allow you to pressure horse from the back or the front or with it it's not it's not it's not not the horse agility yeah. yeah i'll have to check that out um yeah, you know a, i've heard of it that's yeah in the book as well yeah um i have i have a whole session on that because it just builds um those are your basics for riding well right? you know and there's such a parallel because like um dog agility right there's a lot of very similar things i mean there's a time round, but it, it's a very yeah. it's the same thing you don't reprimand the dog it has to be fun or they're not gonna do it but the other, the other big, uh, the big thing is, um, oh my God, and I lost my train of thought on this, was, um, oh, that, so the trainer that I was working with when I was learning agility, she also just did regular obedience training. And she said that agility was probably some of the best thing you could do with a uh, problematic dog, right? A dog that had, you know, a traumatic background or had confidence issues or, you know, had some type of disturbance, behavior disturbance. She said that is like the absolute best thing. And so when she would identify these dogs, because so she worked through like a daycare, she would always recommend to the owner, well, first, if you haven't taken the obedience class, maybe you should do that. But she also wanted, she had like a beginner agility wonderful um for all these problem dogs to go through and that was for the problem dog class and it was you know the changes were were quite you know very yes. rapid like in eight weeks right so you know and it's 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 just it's really interesting to me like the parallels right you know with yes. the horses same it's, thing it's yeah. absolutely the same and actually with my horse riley um his previous owner came into horse agility when i started it up mm. and she said his confidence improved significantly yeah. and he yeah. actually became comfortable with almost anything you could put in an arena. Interesting. He can, he can do it. You know, yeah. he's done a lot of it. He's, he's comfortable with it. It's more the unpredictable stuff out in the big world that he's not comfortable with. Um, but I had people that were um, high level competitors come in and do it just for fun. Yeah. Um, people, it helped with everything because what we're doing in basic agility is we're having the horse go on things, under things, through things and over things. Mm. So that's going to mimic anything we're going to ask them to do. We want you to go into a, onto a trailer. You have to step up. Maybe you have to walk on a ramp. You've got to be on something that wiggles. Yeah. You're going to be ducking under something. You're going to be walking into a narrow area. So one of our agility obstacles is a gap. Okay, we'll call gotcha. a narrow you gap. Through. So you have the yeah. fence on one side and maybe uh, two jump standards, a pole and a tarp on the other, and you make an alleyway. Yeah. So you have a bridge they step up on. You back them up through poles or off a bridge. So you, you have uh, noodles or streamers. Um, you have the car wash, right? Things they have to go in and through and around. So as you're working your basic handling skills, follow me, stop with a breath, back up, draw, send, you're working on the basic handling skills. You're also incorporating all these other aspects of working with different, you know, apparatus and stimulus that is just going to prepare them to be more successful in life, no matter yeah. what you do. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's, it's really, it helps everybody. And it's fun because it's not stressful, right? So it's not very like goal oriented. So not yeah, no, not that is, all. that is really cool. So Heidi, I know we've been, gosh, we could probably talk for another two hours. Okay. So, and I, and I do want to respect the time. Um, but uh, to wrap up, usually I ask, and I think you know from Sharon's. So what was the aha moment for you? Like, I know you've had, you know, 50 years here, but is there an aha moment that you would want to share with the audience? Um, oh, I could probably tell you in each one, but in centered writing, the aha moment was I took, I actually did take my first um, professional riding lesson until I was in my early thirties and mm. lucky with Sally Swift living 10 minutes from here. It was one of, with one of her senior instructors. So one aha moment for me was as the instructor started to talk me through centering, breathing, grounding, relaxing my toes. I thought I have cowboy boots on. How can you tell? But yeah, my toes are <laughs> yeah, yeah. spreading your toes. So 
Yeah. The aha moment for me was bringing in the Eastern philosophies into riding had such a profound effect on my horse. I was mm. riding an Appaloosa mare who was really tight as a tick and we were in a new environment and you had the old appy eyes rolling with the white slayer showing, you know. And as I was talked through these principles that I was very familiar with and applied them, my horse went and she calmed down, she relaxed and my body was so much happier. My knees didn't ache anymore. If you release tension, you get rid of the, the soreness. Oh yeah, all the classic. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. you shouldn't, you know, right. You shouldn't be sore from ache. riding. You shouldn't yeah. be sore from, nothing should hurt. You may have muscles, you know that you've done some work in two point or post, like your groin right. muscle. You know, not saying yeah. you won't feel it, but it should be a good thing, not a bad thing. Yeah. So that was an aha moment in my career in terms of riding. Um, uh, aha moments in working in working with Liberty um, began with someone who apprenticed with uh, Klaus Hempling for a year, mm -hmm. and it was relationship training in a square pen, which is a picadero. Yep. I had had natural horsemanship, you know, experience and round pen experience. So going into a picadero, adding the squares because it gives the horse a voice. Interesting. Put them in a round fence you've taken away a lot of their voice. All they can do is go around in the circle. And then they get, like I mentioned earlier, they get corrected for stopping or turning when 99% yeah. of the time, probably 99.9% .9 of the time, it's the human that caused that inadvertently. Mm -hmm. But then they got their whip or their rope or their flag and told the horse to keep going. So the aha moment was putting the horse in a square pen and then trying to ask the horse to walk around in liberty. And what that does is if you're not quite right, they have a place to go. Yeah, so they and, they, go and off they'll the, stay there. Yeah, yeah, and you don't have a whip and a rope and a stick. You, don't, you know, you might, we right. had a rope that hung heavy in our fingertips that we almost never used. Mm. And so it was stop the bus. What did you have to do? What did you do? Yeah. You got, you got in front of the horse. And I said to the instructor, the first time it happened to me, my horse was walking on a circle, very first clinic. And he flicked one ear, one ear back and forth one time while I was just taking baby steps and he was walking on a circle around me. It's really quiet. And he said, stop. Did everybody see that? Like, You're what? what? I was like, that ear flick? <laughs> yeah. He goes, what did he do? And I said, one ear, the inside ear flicked back and forth really quick. He said, yes. He said, that's because you got in front of the drive line with your center. And I've been doing this for a hundred years. So not hundred, but a very long time. I wasn't new yeah. to this to the idea of where the lines were and where my energy was like I was I, I had some experience and I said oh my gosh it must be like this and I held up like an inch he goes no it's like this and wow he did, like a quarter of an inch so that was an aha moment into oh my gosh how much our body and our energy affect the horse and when you put them in a situation where they can respond to you and share information back to you such as maybe go stand in a corner and then that's like oh wow and then yeah i would say the final aha moment was discovering horse speak and watching not only how that enhanced my relationship with my horse but with every horse i've worked with and with every student i've shared it with those would yeah. be the three big gifts yeah and thank you for those and they're all really i mean honestly we probably could have you back as repeat and we could do an hour and a half on each one of those three oh, moments just on its own. We actually but yeah. Could, I'm sure. yeah, you could. Absolutely. So Heidi, thank you so much. Uh, and um, we, uh, I'll be posting in the show notes. Uh, Heidi has a website. She gives a lot of clinics. They're she's doing a lot online with the webinars. You want to check that out. Uh, and then also check out her book. So thank you, Heidi, again. And thank you, everybody. Oh, thank you, Betsy. It's been my pleasure. Yeah, same here. Thank you. Yeah, take care.